What's up guys? I made it to Florida and I'm down here at Live Free Armory fixing to go in for a shop tour and see what all they make. This is one of my favorite gun companies. Pretty cool place. Really glad to be here. So let's go take a look at it. Alright, let us have your seats before he gets in here. We're going to surprise him. Hey, sit down. Oh yeah, he doesn't know. What the crap is this? Welcome to Live Free Armory. Do you have an appointment? No. No, I'm gone. I'm out. Oh well, there's another one. We're here today with Colby and Ethan from Live Free Armory. Why don't you guys tell us what you guys do here? What number of machines, capabilities, what makes what sets you apart from other companies out there? Start it off, Ethan. Well, uh, we are an OEM manufacturer for firearms parts. We do other parts as well, but we have about 85 machines now. That number is always growing. Uh, we, we can machine just about anything we've got. Five axis, uh, mill turn, we got uh, Swiss capabilities, EDMs, all the good stuff. So we make mostly firearms parts. We make a lot of slides for different platforms. Uh, AR-15s, 308s is our kind of our bread and butter. And we came out with our amp this year. So that's that's been our flagship pistol. And that's our first true from the ground up firearm live for armory. Because yeah. we've been we've been working with you guys for a little while, and up until we came down here and saw the shop, I don't think any of us had any idea how big and how many machines you guys actually had down here. So it was it was kind of an eye opener for us to come down here. And I know as we've been down here talking to you guys, it's always Colby is always looking for the next machine <laughs> and get there. So you may have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> so yeah, we actually have the number I think is 92 uh, last I heard uh, once our gun drill cell comes. So over in our other building, um, we've got a gun drill cell um, should be here in the next few weeks actually. Um, so probably in the next month or two that'll be up and max capacity on that is about 500 a day of AR barrels, um, gun blanks, um, being able to do precision barrels. And kind of, we kind of get that from everybody, you know, where um, people that come down and see the facility don't realize how big we are because we've been behind the scenes and we manufacture a lot of parts for different companies and have been doing it for a long time. Uh, and we have a little bit of everything. Um, we work with a few of the aerospace companies that are around, around here, uh, mostly just because of our capability and being able to have our inspection capability with our CMMs, um, EDM capabilities, um, some of some of the equipment that's not even available in Florida, we actually have here. And we basically take from 
you know, my aerospace background and apply it to firearms. History right there. But tell us the, the, the history of, of Live Free Armory, like where you guys started, how you started, you know, kind of what's going on? So actually it's a garage company. Um, we started in a garage uh, building firearms um, as a first assembling parts. Um, went from there to 2,000 square foot warehouse. Uh, we were still doing the engineering. Um, I was doing the engineering design and then I was subbing it out to um, other CNC shops all across the US. And then as we started growing, then we started having more demand, mm -hmm. um, more on parts, more on material, more, you know, essentially everything. And uh, so in order for quality and in order to keep up with the volume, we started bringing manufacturing in house. Um, and then that's kind of where it grew to where we are now, uh, where we would have one part that we were having issues with. So it's okay, that's, you know, my background. So let's bring in that machine. And then we start making that part. Then we'd have over capacity, so then we'd sell either that part or some other capacity off from that machine to other companies. And then they would increase, we would increase, and from there, we'd add more machinery, and then it just kind of kept growing to it, where we've got 92 machines and almost every capability that you could do on metal. I know you said before that, that you have not run into any part that you haven't been able to make. I thought that was pretty interesting yeah because of because of all the equipment and all the the knowledge that you have I found that very interesting um, okay yeah. yeah and really that's where we're expanding now is um, expanding on those capabilities so we have pretty close to one of everything um, and then just keep building upon that whether it be turning whether it be multi-axis machining whether it be um, our EDM capabilities, um, our inspection lab, you know, that's truly what started the Live Free Armory and uh, that's where we were doing some of the aerospace stuff was based on that as well. And, and I know that up until now, you, you, you've been making AR-15 parts and a lot of slides. Do you have any estimate of how much you have made? Like how many parts? To, I know that's going to be a crazy question to ask, but like, how many are, do you think are out there? Just we do. I want to say we do about twenty thousand parts a week okay. right now. So to just kind of put that into perspective, um, and most of you know most of our parts are more complex parts. It's not little pins or buttons or you mm -hmm. know springs or stuff like that. Um, it's more of the you know, main components that are on there. Oh, but uh, what's your, what is your background, you know, as far as this whole thing? Go for it. Oh, you know I mean? So, uh, I was, uh, I was used to be in the Army. Um, when I got out, I decided to go to school um, due to extraordinary circumstances. I uh, went from a law enforcement degree to mechanical engineering. So I was actually in my last couple years of school when I met up with uh, Colby and became, became an intern, part-time employee here, running machines because they wanted to grow uh, their next engineer from the ground up. So basically I needed to know how, to, how we run everything on the floor before I ever got to engineer anything. And it also gave me a chance to finish my degree. So. Uh, from there, I finished my degree from UCF in mechanical engineering and came over here as a full-time design engineer. And my background as far as firearms parts and firearms go, I've, just, I've been shooting for years, uh, you know, carried a rifle for a living and then got out of it and just kept wanting to be in the shooting sports. So I shoot a lot of competitions. Uh, a lot of my input into designs is based on little things that I've noticed shooting factory parts from competition like some things just don't work well and we have to actually make our own parts to do it you know you get into a stage and it doesn't work the way you want it to so that's that's my background as far as shooting goes what about you Billy? so <clears throat> as far as in the firearms industry um, you know i've been hunting since my dad told me, tells me at three days old 
he brought me around in the truck and uh, was bird hunting. He said he missed a partridge because he went, leaned over, and here I am. So, um, you know, I've been hunting my whole life. Uh, grew up in New Hampshire, up in the mountains. Um, a lot of my family's still up there, so it was a bit of a change coming down to Florida. Um, kind of learning a little bit different aspects on here. Um, and then as far as manufacturing, um, I grew up in a shop. I uh, started when I was about 13, 14 years old, um, just doing part-time, learning how to push buttons. Uh, we did a bunch of contracts for um, another firearms manufacturer. And so that was kind of how I pay paid for college. Uh, went off to school, decided that you know, I wanted to send stuff up into space or I wanted to make really cool things and become an engineer and um, you know, picked up a business management degree along the way. And then, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, school is very expensive, and uh, I was kind of paying through it um, through machining. And once I got my first job, applications decided, well, here yeah, they were going to ship me off to the city, and then I was going to have to pay rent. And then I had six months, and I was going to go back to here's um, or go across the country. And decided, well, I'm going to go back into manufacturing. Um, and I ended up going back into my hometown. I uh, started working there, um, helped grow a shop. Engineering, um, I was still doing a lot of the programming, designing, um, and then I would go and travel over to their shop and try to help them you know, set up with the manufacturing process, the QC process, and then I would go to another shop and I'd try to help them with the manufacturing process and the QC process. And then I got to the point that you know, I moved to Florida and I'm living all across different places across the country, and if we ran into a QC concern or a material concern, then I'm traveling back up there. So it got to the point that it was more beneficial for us to start bringing this in-house. Uh, my plan was to never be a manufacturing company because of all the problems and everything that can possibly go wrong and all the overhead that's involved into it and all the material and all the people, and we've got 115 people that are now, you know, that responsible for it, to mm -hmm. be able to um, continue manufacturing and be able to make you know, our own stuff in these other companies. So as, as we grew and our needs grew, then we just kept bringing it in. It was all based off our engineering. Um, and then bigger manufacturers were coming to us saying, you know, we need help to be able to make these parts. And fortunately, you know, we because of our engineering, because of our inspection, um, we could start adding spindles and be able to ramp up production. And you know, some of our prototyping that we've been able to do that, you know, we got to show you guys this week that we took a concept from, you know, from nothing, a uh, blank canvas, and in one week had a design and in virtual world, you know, worked. And then the next, you know, this week we're already starting to make. And, um, being able to get that part into testing significantly faster where a company, some of these larger manufacturers, you know, it takes them years to be able to launch stuff because of the um, engineering aspect of it where we can get through the engineering and already into the testing and prototyping very quickly. So uh, we've been... We were, we were surprised. We, when we came in Monday, we came down here, the shop was closed, you still had some... I think you were still working on it a little bit, but Tuesday when we got here, you showed us the new project coming up, and then we were out there cutting the first prototype on it. So, like you're looking at next week, you're getting the prototypes going on it, and I mean that's amazing to to me that you go from paper to parts in a mat in a matter of a week or so. And especially multiple parts. You know, I mean, it's one thing to get one job, but where we're making everything in house, we're talking barrel, we're talking bolt carrier group, we're talking the upper, the lower. Um, you know, I mean, even the smaller components that are in there, um, and the the functioning parts that are in there that we go from design and testing and everything else. So it was very cool to have you guys part of part of that process and kind of see what we can do. And you guys just got an Easter egg. <laughs> All right, Colby, we covered this a little bit in one of the other questions, but we've got the two deer heads up there, and when we came down here, you took us hog hunting, so 
we've talked doing that, we know you're a big time hunter, so tell us a little bit about that and how much, what you like about hunting and all that kind of stuff. So, um, grew up in New Hampshire, a um, lot tougher hunting there than quite a few different places. Um, my family, all my family hunts, uh, they're very traditional. We, we don't do deer pushes. We, you know, I mean, we have stands, but we don't feed. We don't, <laughs> we basically work on them. Uh, What's a deer push? It's like a man driven push. Bunch, yeah, bunch, a dog yeah. driven yeah. push. Bunch, yeah. bunch of people okay. on one end and a hunter and somebody yeah. on you drive the deer to drive the deer. Okay. And you basically have a plot of land with roads on certain sides. Now, we, we avoid that plot of land, even though you know there's deer in there, and we go up into the mountains. Um, one of the biggest problems with hunting that way is you're in a mountain where these deer, you know, generally they'll have a circle, but that circle could, they could not come around for two weeks on certain things. Uh, so it was very, very tough hunting, um, but, you know, that's what our entire family has always done, and uh, love it. And since I've moved down here, I've been able to try a few different things, and hog hunting on a buggy, you know. And, that was awesome. And everything I'm thinking, like... No, it's legal. <laughs> Where you know up north it is not. You know, so um, yeah, I've been able to find you know and really enjoy my passion of hunting, and I'm looking forward to taking the con the company to um, a lot of those different models and things that I can use. And I want to start going out west, and I want to start having having some more fun and enjoying that, and being able to bring you know people that haven't hunted before is incredible to be able to bring people from the shop out and uh, you know we just did a Texas hunt uh, with uh, our quality engineer you know and he's from the same area as me and he's never been able to do something like that and to see that and you know that's that's fun and I also watch a lot of meat eater so <laughs> you know I, I look at some of those trips and fishing trips out in Hawaii and all these different places and you know, I'm hoping that I'll be able to expand on that passion and be able to bring people, you know, from company or, you know, just friends, family, everybody else kind of along with me. Yeah, when we were out there on the on the hog hunt and he started talking about he he does gator hunts and he's got he's got stuff out west where he's gonna he's got elk hunts and mule deer hunts. I could just you're you're you were like a little kid in a candy store. His smile just got so big. Just, once, you, uh, once you started talking about that stuff, you were just you were all in. Yeah, I want to be able to go pack out and spend three, four days out and just kind of glass over the mountains and, um, you know, stalk and watch. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, when I go through, you know, a lot of people love the thrill of, you know, the kill or anything like that. I love just being out in the woods and being able to watch. And, you know, I, I come back and I don't have anything. I'm not disappointed. You know, I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, I enjoy go, being able to go out on the fishing boat and just watch everybody else fish and watch you know these mahi you know, just come up you know, eight feet into the Co air a couple of those were a little feisty <laughs> yesterday yeah and uh no it's a lot of fun all right cool ethan That's i know nice. that you uh you touched on the the competition shooting i can tell from our range day with your uh your perfect thumb alignment that you uh <laughs> you shoe lock competitions can you can you tell us like something about the competitions that you shoot in? Because I know those are different types. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. So predominantly, I always shoot in uh, two or three different types. So, so your IDPA, uh, I've shot a couple of those using the amp, and then uh, USPSA, that's all pistol on steel or paper, depending on the competition. But my main one is actually uh, PRS style shooting. That doesn't necessarily mean in the PRS. It could be in our own PRS. You, 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 you got to use those last two acronyms. You got to tell us what those stand for. Precision Rifle Series. Okay. So uh, either bolt or gas gun. I usually run bolt because that's that's where I've learned the most and you get the most capability out of it, at least in my opinion. And then uh, sniper competitions. So that's a two man team. I got a buddy. We go to these different competitions and you do your sniper style shooting in two-man team and it's a little bit harder it's all blind stages it's there's no like gaming it you just do it give us an idea of like target size distance like like i know there's no typical because you say there that they are several different stages but just just give us an idea 
So you do, your general target size in a sniper competition is going to be one MOA, maybe two on the longer stages. Um, your PRS is going to be one to three quarter MOA target from from zero. The uh, shortest range I've ever shot on a PRS match was 100 yards. Uh, from there to about a thousand, sometimes a little bit further. Uh, not very many rifles can get past a thousand with any real accuracy. So, so you, you've you've managed to put some on steel on a small target like that at, at that distance. Wow. Yeah, my smallest target I've shot is about it was a little. It's pretty small. It's about the size of a head at a thousand yards. Well, it was ten thirty seven, but. Like a normal size head or a starter size? Well, wow. yeah. <laughs> a normal one. Okay. <laughs> so I'm really in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, that was a good day. Uh, actually, uh, there was a stage. It was a, a variation of what we call a know your limit stage. So know your limits is varying target size. It goes big to small in a, in a series. And they're all the same distance. They're all right next to each other. But it's kind of a gambling. It gets your gamble fix on if you're a gambler. Uh, if you stop and say, I'm done, you get all your points. The second you miss one round, you lose everything. What's the benefit to keep going? The points go up for you every hit. Points. So if you go from big targets worth like one, it goes up from there, depending on how the stage is set up. But uh, this one was a time, know your limits, so you were just going to shoot it anyway, it didn't matter. And I cleared five targets. Starting from big to small, the smallest was about the size of a head. It was 37 seconds with a bullet gun. Wow. So, that's that, was, that, was pretty, that was pretty crazy. Yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's pretty amazing. Um, I think there's a story floating around about you may have, uh, you may have taken out your, your I'm going to call this your baby, the amp pistol to a competition and did uh, pretty good. Yeah, so... Uh, Right after we finished and did the initial release of the amp, um, me and our customer service rep went to a local IDPA, it's a state level match mm -hmm. that are, is hosted in not too far from the shop where we live. And uh, I finished second in my division in my first major IDPA competition, so. With a brand new guy. With a brand new guy, yeah. Yeah. Not, not even as brand new to you, just a brand new guy. Yeah. So. Actually, we built those guns like three days before, That's... like the Friday before the match. You guys have a tendency to build guns just like three days before, because right before we went hunting, we found out the guns we hunted with, you guys built like three days before we got here. Well, I, I zeroed them the day before you got here. Oh, so. okay. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. You know. We wanted examples of true production guns. We're not going to cherry pick. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say anything, but I'll throw a picture up there. We were able to put one of those brand new guns through the same hole. Yeah, so yeah, Just that one, uh, yeah, you know, the shooter did well. It was a .8 MOA group. Uh, it's pretty good. That's, that's so with, with quality ammo on the Hunter, uh, it's very possible to get something away without any actual work and like you said that's a, a brand new production gun <laughs> yeah that you just put together speaking yeah. of brand new production guns this is my segue because i'm good like this yeah and then you <laughs> announce it oh i know but i gotta announce it because i'm good like up. this no <laughs> speaking of your brand new production guns though talk about your product line what all y'all sell right now and all that and then i got another one that kind of follows this one do you want to do this one? you got this oh, okay <laughs> So uh, our AMP pistol line is, is currently two pistols. So you have the AMP and the AMP X. Uh, it's a aluminum match grade pistol that uh, is featuring a, a fire control unit. That's a modular piece that one serial number, you can change your frames in and out. So we have those two right now. Uh, we also have our 308 line, oh, LF10 line. And uh, that includes the battle rifle, which is a budget oriented, sub $1,000 uh, 308 AR. You have the Hunter, which is an upgraded version of that. And then you have the LF-65 uh, Creedmoor, which is the match, super heavy, super accurate uh, type rifle. Uh, so we have those in the 308 line, and then we have the 556 line, which is a, has our Leo in it. Um, that's what we've got right now for, and then we have our slide options that we also sell. And you also sell match receiver sets, correct? That's yes. Great. And handguards and all the 
Yeah. Stuff and like your 308 or your AR-10 uh, receiver sets, are they, what pattern are they? Uh, they're mostly a DPMS. They're actually a little bit of both in some areas. So there's, we took the good and, and put it up, kind of smash it together until it worked right. Well, that's something that I found out when researching AR-10s is that there's different patterns, and I like the fact that what you just said, you took the best of both and made a uh, really, I guess, an improved version. Yeah. So we got to be privy to some of your future projects, but do you want to give any teasers, any hints? Is there going to be some more pistols coming, some more rifles coming, you know, anything like that? Anything you want to tease out there about what might be coming down the line from Lou Free Armory soon? So there's a few different projects. Uh, we're actually going to be putting together a schedule uh, we always have new prototypes, we always have different designs, everything else that's going on. Um, it's normally multiple projects going on at the same time. So we're going to try releasing them, you know, kind of on a weekly or bi-weekly schedule, um, whether it be different additions to current product lines that we have, um, and then we've got some actually really cool new product lines that are going to be coming out. And um, it's, all, it's all driven off a purpose of providing a quality firearm at a reasonable price. And so some of these projects that are coming out are gonna be very competitive um, and looking forward to getting into your guys' hands and other customers as well. Uh, real quick, unfortunately, I can't talk you into a 22-250 AR, so if he could get a bunch of emails requesting a 22-250 AR, it'd be great, because I'd really like to have one of theirs. So. He's gonna well, get like three. <laughs> To actually expand on that, honestly, a lot of uh, taking our engineering capability and being able to quickly change, we do. You know, if we have a customer that comes here and says, hey, uh, we want to see this addition to it, then that's what we start working on. You mm -hmm. know, we've got a project board and all of a sudden that comes, all right, let's move that three or four projects ahead um, or let's do this to change, you know, and if it's something that we can change in a matter of a couple of days and it's only a few hours of engineering, we'll do it right off. Mm -hmm. um, if it's something that we got to plan in, then we'll schedule it in. But, you know, everything that's reasonable and what we can do, we will add into this. So um, different projects, we're always looking for something fun. Um, we've had some uh, customers here even just last week that were looking at some big caliber, very big caliber guns and maybe putting some parts and pieces together that might lead to a different project hmm. um, i know how, we definitely want to do how some. big of a caliber <laughs> a, a pretty big caliber a pretty big, big enough, caliber. Huh? yeah so the the testing we're gonna have to look at a different range but we got a few different options so like, to be able to what, come up with some, some, some fun hmm. stuff so we've got some stuff like that um that and you know i'm not saying that that's going to come out i don't know if that's going to lead to anything but you never know where in six months from now, we're making five or six different parts from that. And, you know, mm -hmm. we expand on it. Um, I do know we're going to have uh, some product lines that go along with our amp pistol. Um, we're going to build off from that. Uh, we are looking at a subcompact. Um, oh, yeah. So I'll throw that out there because that is a necessity and it is uh, playing around. And I'm, I'm interested, it's in the design stage at this point too. So um, I'm interested in feedback where people are saying they like about certain things, what they would like to add. Um, it's actually you know, further than he thinks it is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you never know. So in, in stuff like that can actually happen pretty quick. Uh, and that's one of the benefits of you all being the engineer, the manufacturer and everything is how quick you can get this stuff from a thought to a actual market to the market product and we're always looking for testing when we went through the amp we did forty thousand rounds um i think you did forty thousand i rounds. did myself forty thousand rounds and i got at least a twenty thousand rounds yep. in as well and uh, we had a point where we actually thought we hurt ourselves <laughs> <laughs> because we couldn't grab anything for a couple of weeks so and i felt the a bunch it doesn't recoil bad at all so that's just a uh, lot of rounds though. we did eleven thousand rounds in one night oh and the only thing that saved us from burning ourselves was we had compressed air we could actually blow on the amp to cool it off in between strings. Gosh, I'm ready. Then we cooked the Cerakote off of it. <laughs> wow. You, so. you heat treated it from the inside. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's fun. I mean, we get to test. 
And, uh, you know, especially being engineers, we get to see, um, you know, what could go wrong, what happens. And if it does, then it's, all right, we stop the project, we go back, we, we fix it. I mean, that is what our, you know, whole company is based off from is, you know, we want to make sure that we have the best product that's out there. And, you know, now we're looking at, you know, different parts of the industry um, where I said, you know, hunting, that's, mm -hmm. you know, my passion. I'm looking at, you know, putting together something that uh, we can have fun with, that I can bring other people with. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. So they like said, try not to do any time frames. Um, you know, that's we'll, when we're ready to release and uh, marketing says we're good to go and production's good to go, QC's good to go, then we start putting time frames to stuff. But uh, those are definitely some of the projects that we've got coming out. Um, one that's going to be released here in the next few weeks uh, that'll be pretty big. Um, so if they followed you on Instagram or Facebook, they'd probably be some of the first people to know what it is. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. The big thing here is customer feedback. So we've had. Um, you know, a customer says, this is, we, this could be a little bit better. We take that feedback into consideration. It, always, oh, it doesn't always make a change, but we take that feedback into consideration and see what kind of change we can make to make it more uh, palatable for everybody. Yeah, that's the thing. Some people may, may contact you and want something different for them, but does this work for everybody? Yeah. That's so, a different question. Yeah. The, and, we're always trying to make a better product. Mm -hmm. So some companies, they just kind of put it at, it seems like, I don't work there, so I don't know, but it seems like they just kind of throw it out there and see what happens. Uh, but we're always, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of late nights and staring at a screen going, will this work? Will this make this better? Will it make it more manufacturable? Mm -hmm. Will it save the, the company money? and make a better product. Because mm -hmm. in a perfect world, we do we would do that. Mm -hmm. If we could save money and make a better product, but it doesn't always happen that way. The one, one major advantage that we do have is um, some of these bigger companies, and like I said, we work with quite a few of them, where they find out that there's a problem. You have to change the entire production process. You have to stop and you know, send people home, you have to, you know what I mean? So they kind of have to work through it and it takes a significantly longer process where we can do something where I get a phone call and I've got my laptop on me, doesn't matter where I am, um, I can do an adjustment from there. We have an entire engineering team that can do an adjustment. Um, we can have something, you know, fixed, modified and, you know, in production in a matter of hours where some of these larger companies, it it takes months to be able to do that. they got to contact people here, there, everywhere to fix what you guys can just do right then. And, and just from being down here with you guys, I've seen you guys are two of the most driven people I know. You guys work like my wife does. <laughs> <laughs> she is, oh, you guys are always on, you're always here, you're always doing something. Yeah, what time was Ethan texting you last night? Like 9.30 30 he was still working like at the eight or nine, you were like you <laughs> knew you were in the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you were you were in the new project coming up. <laughs> sitting in bed working <laughs> sitting, on, so. sitting in bed running past for the machine. Yeah. Jake Walt called me, um, they were having a problem with one of the robots. Um, and it just froze up and he called me and he's like, uh, are you in bed? Yep. He goes, Why do you have your laptop? What are you working on? I'm like, ah, I'm programming. It's 10 o'clock. Yeah, I'm programming. All right, show me what's going on. And, you know, he'll FaceTime me and walk him through the problem. And, you know, we got to have a pretty good jump on it. All right, we touched on this a little bit in the last one, but we're going to go back. Just curious on how long it took to take the amp from idea to parts out the door and how many revisions, are, uh, revisions there were. In the process, if you got a rough idea, I've heard that the first one was was a little scary with a, a giant old grip on there that Colby seems to love. I loved that one. <laughs> it was awesome. Um, and then how many <laughs> test rounds did we go through? I mean, we just talked about 40,000 here and 11 in one night, and you destroyed the Cerakote in a, in a series of small fires. <laughs> <laughs> um so from the initial meeting, Colby brought me in and said, we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do it. 
um, it actually did not start out the way it ended. So it, it was well, completely sure, different it didn't. Uh, back then. Uh, so from there to the time we actually shipped the first guns was about 12 months. So that's still a pretty accelerated time frame from going from idea to shipping the first one. On your very first hand guys. Yeah, from right. our perspective, it, it's slow. We, yeah. Uh, it is our first ground up project. So we had to learn a lot and there was also a short break in between there. It was about three months long that we had to switch gears and change because we actually moved to the new building and had to set all this stuff up. And So, so you could, just for practical purposes, you can subtract that. So really probably nine months. Yeah, that was from you when, can't count the moving. Yeah, that was that was from uh, when we first had the meeting about the part to when we announced it at Shot Show. Okay. And then there was about two months of getting the manufacturing going and getting everything going from there. Uh, as far as revisions, uh, there was at least seven major revisions between. And did you guys keep? Samples of those? I, I do have some samples. I have because some of the got, original 3D printed. If we've got if we've got some of that, that would be fantastic. Are, are they for so. public consumption? Since they're prototypes, can we look at them? I guess so, but everyone's going to make fun of my... <laughs> well, it's, it, it was awesome. I can actually <laughs> kind of line it up, like how they were originally going to go. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It originally wasn't going to be aluminum frame. Really? It was going to be a polymer frame gun. And we can cut aluminum, but I can't cut polymer. Mm. So that's kind of the prototyping became that. And it was like, oh, this is a, this is a really good shoot. We started shooting the prototypes that were made out of aluminum. Oh, it's really nice. And then it just kind of transformed from there. So the initial like design idea changed quite a bit from day one to 365. It, it, it does. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? What was the initial idea into that involve the FCU? Uh, yes, it did. What What was it? If it changed, what was the original idea? Like, the, I'm saying the material change and okay. like the, from, they went from yeah, we're gonna have we're gonna have polymer frame to how we so to the aluminum. Frame. I can. The entire project was based on. We make a lot of aftermarket parts mm -hmm. for these poly 80 frames. And one of the biggest problems is we have to open up tolerances because these rails are all <laughs> over the place. And it's just constantly from one, you know, and people drill holes and it's like this, and then one's up here and one's down here. And then once you bring that up, then now you're, as you're trying to do your engagement, like everything is based off that rail system. So out of frustration said, why can't, if it was just all machined at one time, you know, and all, you know, almost all polymer guns are, they have these um, bent rails and that are at different angles. And you pick up one gun to the next gun, and you take mm -hmm. the same slide and you put it on this slide and then it feels a little gritty and then you flip it over to the other one and all of a sudden it feels fine. So that was where the FCU came in, which says, okay, I want to do it in one flat shot and we can control that within two tenths of a thou all the way around. And now we build the entire gun down and the entire gun up. So then it really didn't, it really didn't matter as far as what was on the bottom of, you know, when we first did it with polymer. Um, and then we started playing around with aluminum and I actually had a lot of aluminum that was um, pre-ordered that was coming in and all of a sudden stacking up outside and I said, well, let's try it. You know, so and then once we tried it and we all looked around and said, wow, this this is actually this is really nice. And then we kept kind of expanding off from that. So it was one of those things that it really went from trial and, and uh, error of you know what what was available and how we built this gun and then we just kept kind of tweaking it to what people wanted to see and it was all based off from the rail system and the fire control unit and being able to adjust your frame to the correct shooter and being able to put different grips in it and making this very module to everyone so how many 
realms do you think you guys went through with testing? I'd say I, it's pretty close. It's like 75 to 100. You kind of get lost when you're shooting so much. There was like a solid two months of my life that was just shooting. 75 to 100,000, not 75 to 100. <laughs> yes. it, 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 we got, it would, I would show up to work at 8, and I would grab guns, I'd grab ammo, and I'd grab a helper, and we'd go out and shoot. And well, I mean, the good thing is, though, you did all that when ammo was plentifully available and cheap, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it was like, oh, by the way, we're out of ammo again, so we'd have to wait for another 5,000 rounds to show up here or, and there. Or we'd get anxious, and we would stand in line in Academy, and there'd be five <laughs> of us in line, and I'm just handing my credit card back. And just keep going. So what you're care. saying, you all are responsible for us not being able to buy ammo for this. Well, if you, know, if you live in Florida, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Let me ask one one more follow up question. Is that how the FCU came into play because of the rail system? Absolutely. Okay. It was because of the rail system that I wanted it perfectly flat. So that's why we do it on. You know, we'll be able to show you even um, how we machine that we machine that on a five axis and we machine that flat and then that way we can rotate everything and everything is relative to itself and consistent our heat treated uh 17 4 and then we do a quick prep op from there and then it's going to load on this fixture between these two machines and this will run automated where the robot will actually come in grab these parts load on from there Come in, drop that one, grab the next one, and load on from there. So this is our finished fifth axis part. Then we're just going to flip it over, mill off the back, and then put one of the locating tabs onto the front. Part, well, it's, part. it's definitely an added benefit that you can swap out the frames all because of fixing one problem, you came up with another benefit. One of our biggest problems, I will say, with the design, and when we, you know, when we talk about the subcompact, that it might be a little bit different, is the manufacturing of it is very cumbersome to be able to machine that on one solid heat-treated piece. You know, it's one thing to bring it soft, but we have to we start hard and mm -hmm. to machine it all, so that way it doesn't have to go to a secondary process, and there's no twist, there's no bend, there's no anything on there, um, so it does limit. You know, the different volume, and I'm speaking now to my distributors as we're sending them out. Well, here's the million dollar question. Did you, uh, were there any issues with, with that project, with the, with the AMP, and uh, have you, were there any lessons learned through this process? <laughs> Literally all of them. Uh, <laughs> so, I'll, I'll take this one. Okay. Um, yes, so there were, it was definitely a learning curve um, it was there was a frustration period for a while um, you know we when we first went through all of the testing it was all based off OEM parts um, as our volume started picking up getting those OEM parts and we're talking a little I mean we were making 80% of the gun 85% of the gun mm -hmm. and we're talking springs we're talking guide rods we're talking triggers I mean these little parts that um, these companies are doing by the thousands a day those were the parts that we started having issues with, um, and it took a, you know a little bit in the process to be able to see that. So now we actually brought all of those parts in house. Any part that we said, okay, this is a critical component. If the material is not correct, if the machining on it's not correct, if it's a MIM part, I hate the word MIM. <laughs> now, tell, I know everybody knows what it is, but tell us what that means. Metal injection molding. It is a cool process. It is definitely a cool process. Um, you know, if you want to pull up a YouTube video, but as soon as you watch anybody watches that process, you can see where you're going to have, you know, you take metal and you take a little bit of plastic and you inject it into each other and heat treat it. And then you try to control that shrink of what it's going to be. There's too much room for variation. So, mm -hmm. um, things like extractors we went through and okay, we're now doing it at a billet. Um, we're machining stuff hard. We're doing, locking blocks trying to get the locking block from even you know standard oem putting them in and the holes don't quite line up well we have no forgiveness it is a metal frame um it is a metal fcu and a metal locking block that all have to line up so they have to be concentric within each other for you know two three probably five tenths 
um, to be able to get everything to align properly. Um, so we made them out of billet. It's one of those parts that no other company would even think about making out of billet because it's so many different angles and processes and stuff that does it, but it made for a better part. Um, you know, we got to play around with different materials. Um, when we get to, you know, we get to five, 6,000 rounds and all of a sudden we'd start to see, you know, a structure crack or, on it or something along those lines. And we'd be like, all right, we stop, we go back, let's try a different material. And we got to go through and test a lot of the material and it was really good for our engineering. It was really good for our entire team because we learned so much through this process. Now we're already applying that to, you know, guns that we're making now, and new products that are coming out. And that's expedited it. Um, and then now being able to have relationships for help the testing process that, you know, where Ethan says, okay, two months, it was probably closer to three to four months of this entire process was just shooting every single day and trying to get, all right, let's see what's going on. Let's, you know, let's see where we're starting to see stress on it, where we're seeing. And, uh, you know, the best part is we ended up coming up with a very flat shooting gun and uh, one of the parts that can can I at least say it because it's going to be coming out in the next week or two Ooh, we're going to say whatever you want to you all right uh, internally compensated slide oh snap <laughs> <laughs> so we got to test that this week as well and somebody uh, got to test it a little too enthusiastic <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, job. <laughs> <laughs> we went through that and putting camera on it, got to see how well it really works. Um, and we'll take that and we're gonna apply that to different guns and we're looking forward to that that coming out. Um, and, you know, the, like I said, the testing process, that was the biggest thing that we got to learn and we're gonna now apply to our different products, and especially as we grow well, as a company. One thing about it though, if anybody does have problems, you guys have a pretty good warranty, don't you? A lifetime warranty on all of our products. Um, that is one thing. Anything that you look up on Live Free Armory, um, you know, we always have customer service on here. Someone will always take your phone call. Um, we guarantee anything. We actually, uh, we just had a customer, um, which is probably something we should put marketing on. So we had a customer that had his amp, and he was cleaning that, and then he had a three six five and he had a G19 and he was going through cleaning those and his wife didn't like the smell of the cleaner so she put a, a candle <laughs> next to him and almost burnt their entire house down. Um, you know the two polymer guns didn't make it so well uh, luckily being a uh, metal metal frame gun uh, he ended up you know, contacting us. We, all we had to do was replace the cruciform in, in the back, and I think that was about it, right? It was, it was the trigger, uh, the, the whole trigger, and then his, the plastic inside of the striker. Yeah. And the, oh, and his red dot was messed up, and the fiber optic melted out of the front sight. Okay, so yeah, no, he had a serious fire, and you know, we replaced everything from there. Um, we've had uh, people that have, you know, anybody that, what is it? We will fix stupid once. Yeah. And you know, we all I'll make fix mistakes. stupid once. <laughs> we'll fix stupid once. We've had mistakes. Um, well, you're where, like Smith. <laughs> you know, so you mean I can't call Smith on it? <laughs> Bust people the have uh, put, you know, aluminum parts in just a metal vise and they collapse the upper. Um, Fixing someone else's problem is uh, that, that that's above and beyond. And yeah, as far as customer service goes, that's really taking care of them and uh, that impressed me. So, this is probably more for Kobe, but uh, where do you see LFA in 10 years? Where do you guys want to be? Where are you going to be? So, the plan is actually 30 years. So, we're, we're laying things Oh, out. he's looking way <laughs> So, I'm still young. Um, my plan in 30 years is to be one of the largest manufacturers. Um, right now, we're averaging about 22% growth. Um, you know, that's a little aggressive. We are going to, you know, slow down. Um, but if we maintain, you know, 8% growth over the next 30 years, then we'll be comparable to the largest manufacturers in here. And the plan is to be able to provide, you know, 
we're not making three thousand dollar guns we're not making four thousand dollar guns um guns that everybody can still afford and shoot and you know put quality to that product and where it needs to be um and you know it's all based off our engineering capabilities and you know we've got we've got one of the hardest parts down and being able to have the manufacturing and the engineering now we just need to be able to expand you know and uh, we don't have large you know there's no big investors that we're answering to they're you know it's just me <laughs> so you know that does slow growth but that's what allows us to be able to keep expanding from here one thing you kind of didn't touch on in this so far but talk about that you all are u.s manufacturer using everything u.s correct <laughs> yes that is very important uh that's important to the entire company and you know something that we need to stress more um you know covid was a big example of that and uh it was a pretty good advantage that we had and it's something that we started from the beginning um, is that all of our material comes from the u.s um, we cut about forty thousand pounds of stainless a week right now uh, we've got a, a about the same in aluminum um, and it all comes from the US so even these larger manufacturers they started having issues being able to get material and they started calling us because we had it we have you know 40 80 hundred thousand pounds on our floor um, we have 200 thousand pounds that's in Orlando and then you know our mill runs that are still sitting up in Chicago that come down um, so as COVID hit and everybody that was trying to save a few cents here, a few dollars per pound. And I understand, you know, bottom line, it does, it definitely <coughs> adds up. You know, I've got some products that, especially right now where prices are going up and we haven't increased prices on um, any of our completed products. And I'm just eating the material costs, but it's still not worth saving that extra dollar per pound. Or, you know, sometimes it's significant, but, um, you know, that's something that we, truly feel at Live Free Armory and one of my passions is to be able to bring up American manufacturing and through some of the innovations, through some of the high speed machining, high feed machining, some of the tooling, some of the stuff that, you know, I got to show you guys this week of what we do, um, we can compete with lower wages with, you know, overseas and we can, we truly, I believe that we truly can compete on manufacturing level with these other countries. We just need to invest into it. We need to invest in the people is the main thing is making sure that people, you know, are keeping our engineering in house, keeping our manufacturing, the trade schools. Um, you know, I've been looking at, I've got an insane schedule, but teaching classes to be able to, you know, I can kind of cherry pick as well, you know, through the class um, and then be able to find people that work, you know, that come and, work here and enjoy what they do, but we really need to encourage manufacturing mm -hmm. in the U.S. And we can compete. I know we can. We're doing it right now. Yeah, and, it is. you know, and I've had some projects where I know I'm competing against a foreign company and I'll, I'll go down a little bit lower just so we keep that project in the U.S. And it has nothing to do with trying to make, you know, trying to make all this money on top of the end. It's just, that's something that I believe truly is important. All right. Well, that was the uh, full-on interview. Now I get to the lightning round. These are a little lighter. <laughs> a little lighter questions. I thought we here. were done. No. Well, well, it's it's a lightning round. Come on. This is this and you only have five seconds to answer. Oh, All right. Shit. Oh, I can't think that quick. <laughs> yeah, sure you can. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Coke. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Mountains. Cake or pie? Cake. I have crumbs. I can't eat either. Oh. Cheesecake. <laughs> <laughs> cheesecake. Celebratory cheesecake. Celebratory cheesecake. All right. Hollower or metal? Metal. metal. I had a feeling they'd answer that one. What? <laughs> Unreal. I never would have thought that. <laughs> hey, as far as dinner and food, cow or chicken? Cow. Cow. Correct answer. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yes. Anything can be a sandwich. Fair enough. Nine millimeter or 45? Nine millimeter. Nine millimeter, because you can at least afford to shoot it. 
Unless it's 10 millimeter, which is the best millimeter. The best millimeter. <laughs> as far as music goes, country or western? <laughs> no. <laughs> country. Uh, did he just say no? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I thought so. What is your favorite hunting caliber and why is it 270? And why is it 270? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. 30 odd six. And that is truly because that's what I hunted with as a kid. How is 30 out of 6 greater than 270? It's a it was um, rifle my grandfather. Oh, okay. I'll give you that. Six, five. No, we, we saw. We saw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody's going to see soon. Nah. Uh, what is your favorite style of pizza, and why is it Chicago-style pizza? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it, Chicago? Is it deep dish? It's it's deep I just dish. like deep, dip, deep dish pizza. We're that's actually going to be in Chicago yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. Jared Dallas. Jared Dallas. As long as my pizza used to have a face, I'm good. <laughs> like, none of that vegetable <laughs> crap on it. All right, well, that's it. All right, I want to say a big thank you to Colby for having us down. We had a wonderful time this week. Everything was amazing. Had a lot of fun. Got to learn a lot about the process that goes into making their guns and just what all they can do. Their shop is huge. And make sure you check them out. You can look them up on the internet or they're on Facebook and Instagram at Live Free Armory. So follow them there. That way you can get updates on the newest products they're coming out with. And I'll put links in the description below to all the other guys' videos. They'll be down there. But thanks again for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it.